Hi, JP Fournier of The Movie Jerks here, and I am on my eighth week of self-quarantine. Uh, during this time, of course, I haven't had a haircut, so for this video I will be a little shaggy. Other than that, I'm doing quite well. Um, I've been able to catch up on all the films I've always wanted to see in the past, but never had the time or the opportunity. Uh, I did that within the first two weeks. So now I'm, I'm just stuck with films I've never seen before. What I've done is I've compiled a list of, well, about uh, 2,300 of the movies that I have and that I have not had a chance to watch. Now, these are movies that are sent to us from uh, basically other suppliers or fans. Uh, it's also movies that are on streaming sites that I just have no interest in watching. But I have put them all together, and instead of procrastinating and trying to find out what film to watch, I've just been taking random films and watching them. So, let's see what we have today. I will list them off right here, and then as I get to a certain part, I'll click on the poster view, and we'll watch the four next films that are showing. So, I got Collision Course. Now, this is one I had a little bit of an interest in because it's supposedly what Jay Leno hates the most in the world. He is embarrassed by the film and wish he'd never done it. So I'm kind of curious. Uh, we got Fred 3, Fred Camp, or Camp Fred. Uh, this one here is one that we put on the list just because we were trying to make someone watch it for our podcast. We thought we were being funny. And I guess the joke's on me, so I'll be watching that one. God's Not Dead, uh, A Light in Darkness. Now, I, I think this is the third film, so uh, I haven't seen the second. I saw the first, absolutely hated it, and we'll see if the third one can compare. Oh, and we got a movie called Something. I, I hope uh, the title came from them being just literal, I, uh, bringing their movie to a movie fest and... They just basically said, yeah, your movie's been entered, but we just need a title. You know, well, we don't have a title. Well, we can't enter your film unless we have a title, so you have to call it something. And there's the title. So let's see uh, what these four films are going to bring for me this week. Collision Course turned out to be way more racist than I had suspected it might be. The only guy from Japan doesn't know karate. Oh! Ah, not true. My brother not know karate either. This film uses more racial slurs than Goodfellas uses the F-bomb. Help you. You know, I ought to stir fry your face. But hey, at least Jay Leno is terrible. The rest of the cast, like Ernie Hudson, Chris Sheridan, Randall Tex Cobb, Tom Noonan, and Pat Morita. Yeah! plus a slew of character actors, are all fine. But Leno's performance is so bad, it brings everyone down with him. No, I'm on something, pal. I'm on your ass, that's what I'm gonna be on. You're sick, buddy. You're sick. This film is just as unfunny, scuzzy, and outdated as a Monica Lewinsky on, joke. Get the hell back down there. Welcome to the Tonight Show, nice to have you. Oh, and... And happy Monica Day, everybody. Today is Monica Day, of course, it. across the United Finally. States. Is it a federal holiday, I think? <laughs> Probably. All zippers at half mass or something? I don't know, but that happened. What a dick. Fred 3, Camp Fred. If you don't know who Fred Figglehorn is, he is a YouTube sensation. Uh, they got really popular and made the choice to go into feature films. This is the third and final Fred Figglehorn film. In this one, Fred dreams about going to a ritzy camp, but instead gets sent to a low-grade alternative camp. It's called Camp Superior. Not I want a pee-pee. Who would name their camp that? It's the stupidest name ever. And therefore a lot of screaming and unfunny jokes ensue. The whole concept of Fred Figglehorn is that he's a six-year-old child who's been neglected by his mother and has no control over his emotions. Ah! 
the joke lies on him being annoying. And this film sets out to be annoying. And I gotta give it to it. The film achieves what it sets out to do. And this film is proud of being annoying. They even make jokes and nod to the screen, letting us know that they know how annoying the film is. Oh, Mom, I had the most horrible nightmare. I dreamt you sent me to the worst summer camp ever, and also I had this weird sped-up chipmunk voice that got really annoying after a while. And f for that, I, I can't hate upon a film that creates a goal and achieves it. They set out to be annoying, and they accomplished that, so good on them. However, in IMDb's trivia about the film, it reads, While not yet officially listed by any film history body, this is still considered to be the worst movie of all time by everyone who's seen it. No, it's not. By who? Who says that? Uh, these are probably people who have never seen Collision Course, I would gather. Uh, but I would say this is not the worst film of all time. This is not even the worst Fred Figglehorn film. You see, by this time, it was very evident that the Fred Figglehorn character had already worn out its welcome. So this film was preparing itself for the backlash of terrible critic reviews. We're the best at being the worst. Say it with me. We're the best at being the worst. We're the best at being the worst. We're the best at being the worst. While it is not a good film by no means, it still makes sense from beginning to end. I will even admit liking a returning joke of Fred never meeting his father, so he imagines his father is John Cena. And because the only thing he knows about John Cena is that John Cena is a wrestler, whenever his father visits, he gets wrestled. This is a cute idea, and there's something satisfying about watching Fred get pummeled. This film saying it's the worst movie of all time is like a dummy having to tell everyone that they are smart. Because the dummy also knows that everyone can see how much of a pathetic moron they really are. And for Donald Trump's very, very large a brain, he's... And for that, I cannot recommend this film, even ironically. God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness. This one caught me by surprise. It is a better film in comparison to the first movie. The acting and directing is vastly improved, plus the writing shows signs of self-awareness. Hey man. Oh, Thank you. However, by the end of this film, I was more confused of what the message really was. For me to explain this, I'll have to go into some spoilers for the ending. So, if your intentions are to watch this before I ruin it, you can skip to this timeline to see the final review. The film begins with some generic narration. Sometimes all it takes is a spark. Something very small. But the spark becomes a flame. And if that flame spreads, power can be so overwhelming it transforms everything around it. Then on to Reverend Dave being released from jail from something that happened in the second film. He is picked up by his friend Jude. The two of them give some exposition about the state of his church while daydreaming about waffles. Now can we get some waffles? <laughs> we find out the church is built on a state college and it is the only religious building that's in the area. Because of this, the students have started protesting for the church to close their doors and move on. Let me hear. This is no longer a Christian school. The church really should have moved off campus 50 years ago when the state bought the university. Instead, funding is given disproportionately to one religious organization while other ones are being denied. So Later that night, a brick is thrown through a church window that sets off gas, which ignites when Jude turns on a broken light bulb. Murdering Jude. At this point, the college faculty decides that this church causes too much controversy, and therefore they are no longer renewing the property rights and asking the church to leave. This causes Reverend Dave 
to seek out his atheist lawyer brother Pierce, who he has not seen in 10 years, to help him sue the college and save his church. What follows is a bunch of debates about discrimination and having the right to believe in what you want to believe in. This causes Reverend Dave to start taking things personally, which also leads to the best scene of the film. And he was never proud, David. This has nothing to do with pride, Roland. And no offense, but maybe you'd understand a little better if you were the one being attacked. Brother, who do you think you're talking to? I'm a black preacher in the deep south. I could build you a church with all the bricks been thrown through my windows. You're right, I'm sorry. <laughs> nice. The Brick Kid, stricken with guilt, finally meets up with Reverend Dave. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Is it? Tell me! Wait. Ah. Oh. You killed two, didn't you? Hey, hey, hey. take it easy, pal. Oh. Oh. What is wrong with you? This violent attack gets shown on the news and is going to hurt the trial to save Reverend Dave's church. Frustrated with his actions, Pierce reminds Dave that back in their childhood, Dave pushed away Pierce because Pierce started questioning the faith. Do you have any idea what you did to mom and dad? You broke their heart. You're the one that broke my heart. You really don't get that, do you? You didn't take the time to understand what I was going through. I was trying to sort out my own faith. This allows Reverend Dave to make the connection that him pushing away Pierce when Pierce was losing his faith in God is no different than the college pushing Reverend Dave away because he does believe in God. Therefore, Dave forgives the brick kid, drops the charges on the college, and hands over the church so they can turn it into a student center. Although St. James has meant everything to me, although it's been my whole life, I would gladly give all of that up for this. For you. Now, if this is a story about Reverend Dave learning how to use his past to live a better future, then this might be a nice story. However, I don't believe that this is the message that this film was trying to convey. For us to understand the film's message better, let's go back to the first sentence of the film. Sometimes all it takes is a spark. At first glance, the film would like us to think that Reverend Dave is the spark. As it repeats the first lines about the spark after Reverend Dave's final speech. Sometimes all it takes is a spark. Something very small. And this is an incorrect assumption because Reverend Dave didn't come to the conclusion until the end of the story. While the nonviolent protesters already knew the information he needed to know while he was in jail. He can't be the spark because he's the last one to the party. So what is the real spark? Well, let's take a look at the literal spark. The one that ignited the gas when God killed Jude. Now I'm not being facetious here in how I phrase that. This film constantly reminds us that everything happens because of God's will. I'm sorry. This is not your fault. God, he uses all things for his good. And God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. So in this film, God kills Jude so that Reverend Dave can learn a lesson. For us to believe this, we would also have to believe that God was setting up the long con. This means going back in time when Dave was a child, God made him and his parents force Pierce out of their home because Pierce was becoming an atheist, which leads to Pierce becoming a lawyer, all so that Reverend Dave could hire Pierce in the future so that Pierce could get a chance to confront Dave about being a bigot that distances himself from non-believers which is no different than the nonviolent protesters trying to distance themselves from Reverend Dave and his church. Okay, so there's that point of view, but let's take a look at another spark 
This one comes from the same voice that we hear at the beginning and the end of the film talking about the spark. This one happens here when students are talking about the Mandela Effect. The Mandela Effect is the phenomenon of multiple people sharing the same incorrect memory at the same time. Oh, it's called the Mandela Effect. Millions of people thought that Nelson Mandela died in prison in the 80s, but he didn't. While there are many theories why this happens, these students bring up the multiple universe theory and contemplate a different dimension or mirror world that may be out there. Having a second world is contrary to Pastor Dave's limited-minded quotation that we hear him spout out at the beginning of the film. How do you define truth exactly? Truth is a person. The person of Jesus Christ. It's the one truth of all others. So yeah, given the choice, I'm taking the Kit Kat theory. And if we get lucky, maybe we'll collide with the reality where our school isn't poisoned by Reverend Dave and his one truth. These students don't condemn religion or religious belief, nor do they talk about Christianity in a negative light. Instead, they hypothesize that perhaps there might be another world with another information and other truths, and revel in the concept that there may be additional information out there beyond their grasp. This causes our narrator to insult the group. What am I? I'm annoyed by you because you're annoying leave the room in a huff, then breaks up with her boyfriend because he doesn't believe in Jesus the same way she does. Keaton, I don't care what you believe and don't believe. And I don't have a problem with God. Yeah, but you do, Adam. What she does here is called bigotry. Intolerance towards those who hold a different opinion from oneself. This is a form of discrimination. And discrimination is considered a sin in the book of rules to which she lives her life by. Feeling drunk, betrayed, and defeated, the boyfriend sees a church sign that says, All are welcome here. He associates the sign with how he was treated by his ex-girlfriend, which causes him to pick up a brick and throw it at the church. And the brick is what causes Jude's death. This discrimination is much like Pastor Dave's pushing away his atheist brother. And it is also like these non-violent protesters seeking equality by pushing out the bigots. So in the end, this self-centered Christian girl who judges others indirectly causes the death of an innocent man. takes no credit for all the hate and vile misdirections of those around her. Maybe that one, that'll give them some sort of closure. Okay, I don't know. Okay, so say you confess. Maybe they'll go easy on you, but maybe they won't. Keep secrets so she doesn't get in trouble herself. So how's stuff going with the church? Have they found the person who did it? Not yet. They're still investigating. Oh, I just figured, like... Fingerprints or whatever. Oh, it's not quite like the movies. She even has the audacity to accuse Reverend Dave of being too judgmental. Did you ever even stop to ask why Adam threw that brick? He's tired of feeling judged and rejected by the people who should be loving and accepting. And comes out scots free in the end. Therefore, God's not dead? Yeah, I don't get this film. Something. When I first started this film, I could have sworn that I was in for another disappointment. The cinematography came off sloppy and unconfident. The acting appeared amateur and even foreign, as if they were being dubbed. But as the film gets into the story, it becomes intriguing. With two first-time mom and dads struggling with their fears of not being great parents. Strange things start to happen in their home that has each of them suspecting the other is lacking sleep. Suffering through exhaustion. Or even losing their sense of reality. What is it? Why does it say that it's 55 degrees in there?
What? What did you see? Could one of the two be subconsciously their own worst enemy? A knife? I just found it in the crib. It was inches away from the baby. Well, I didn't put it there. A knife? I, I mean... I would never... I mean, if... If, if I put that there, then I just put it down for a moment. Or is there something more sinister connected to this home? Oh, no, wait. Put that, put the, put the light back on. Something is a slow burn, building up tension as situations get more dire and the stakes begin to increase. It does take its time to build up, but what it does is lead you to a jump scare that is not only earned, but satisfying. This film plays on real fears of first-time parents worrying that they will not be adequate to raise a baby. While the ending delivers a reveal that may split audiences, I felt it made sense and fit the film nicely. But then again, I did watch this one after having endured Collision Course, Fred 3, Camp Fred, and God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness. Out of all the four films, something was a nice surprise. And there you have it, four random reviews. If you'd like to see more random reviews in the future, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube page, leave comments in the comment section, or go to www.themoviejerks.ca.